Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most will be can, and on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of limitations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of the independence, we go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the order or to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do here how the friend we got here. Thanks for listening and uh hold on. It's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today is date February the 18th, 2023, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, most will be can on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense of it all. Before I do get started, guys, let you know that even though we are a news podcast, we do try to watch our language, but sometimes words do fly. At the same time, there may be things that might be shown that might be too intense for younger viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. Aside from that, welcome. So, um, how do we start this? Well, there is no other way to start this except for the fact of the matter that I thought Tennessee for the longest time, well, tried to participate in the Hold My Beer Championships. Yes, um, the bill for banning drag queen shows in Tennessee, unfortunately, did pass the Senate to a 26 to 6 vote, um, which makes it harder for those in that entertainment industry to actually have performances because of confused conservatives and religious repressed people. Yes, I said it. Um, just because drag queen shows, for some odd reason, conservatives think that are detrimental and harmful to today's youth, but at the same time, they are always caught with them same people as uh, lovers, as children, as a love child, as love child, love, let's just say children born out of wedlock, let's just go with that, um, in a very big do as I say, but not as I do. Well, it's not just Tennessee that has learned that, yes, if we don't like something, we can create a bill and just sit there and say, no, blame children and say that's the reason why we did it. Kentucky is no different and following same said suit. For Uma Jules, performing in drag is an outlet for her creativity. She says doing this saved her life. I didn't have purpose and drag brought purpose to my life. She sees it as a chance to create something beautiful. For me, drag is an art. Once a month, she performs here at Crossings, a gay bar in Lexington co-owned by Rebecca Richter. And we host uh, quite a few of those here. But if some state lawmakers have their way, the curtain will close on their performances for the final time. It seems we're quite specifically um, aimed at diminishing the visibility of uh, our community. The bill focuses on what it calls adult-oriented businesses, including places that host drag performances. Under the proposed law, bars like Crossings wouldn't be able to host drag shows because it is less than a 1,000 feet from a park, a library, and a residence. Just one of those spots is enough under the law. It makes me very sad. Bill co-sponsor Lindsay Tishner told us over the phone that part of her concern stems from hearing about what she calls a family-friendly drag performance at a park in Owensboro that children attended. They're adult-oriented performances. There's no reason children need to be exposed to that. Jewel says that people like Tishner should see a drag performance for themselves where they can see performers adapt to who is in the audience. Drag is just about the most unsexy thing I can think of doing. And if you are wanting to sexualize drag, uh, I think that's on you and, and not on the performer. What do you say to people who might say that not all drag performances are sexualized? Well, I guess my question in turn would be why do they feel a need to expose children to any of it? Rector says bars like theirs already don't allow people under 21 in. I think we have to put some standard around it. Otherwise, the door stays open. Jules says people can leave a show at any time and added the drag shows aren't the only place where kids could be exposed to obscenities. I think laws that limit creativity or seek to censor art don't have society's best interests at heart. In Lexington, Ricky Sayer. So a few things I want to point out here, because it's that's the excuse that they give. When I say excuse, the excuse is, well, why do they feel the need to expose children to that? Um, it's not them. Drag queen shows, especially like drag queen story hour, story time, uh, story hour, um, this is usually done in libraries. Um, parents bring their children, number one, 
because reading is fundamental. Number two, I think more of a cultural aspect that if you get children to see that there are different people out there other than them, you don't you don't actually raise bigoted, xenophobed, thinking racism or any of that nature is a funny people. You know, like the girl, like the girl just now, like the girl I talked about um on Wednesday, the girls who spray pay themselves in blackface and said, You're one of them now. You have privilege. You can say the N-word. Where do you think that's learned? Again, the same thing in Catholic, that was a Catholic school, a Catholic school where they did that. I can go back forward and see, I can even go back, say, in the same state of Kentucky, where an RA had to deal with a drunk white girl who had no problem calling her the N-word and felt safe. Again, that behavior is learned. So what does that do with drag queen shows? Well, because the simple fact of the matter is there are just some people out there who don't want to admit that they just don't like being comfortable. They're, they're not comfortable with it. But you know why they can't say it? Because if they say it, then you're then you're labeled. And we've seen what happens when you get labeled. You get canceled. You lose your job, especially if you did something stupid. But what can they do? They can't sit there and say, well, I don't like drag queen shows to make me uncomfortable. But but let's use the kids. Let's just sit there and say, well, kids shouldn't be exposed to this or kids shouldn't be exposed to that. Really? I have a wonderful I have a wonderful question for all those that feel that way. Do you let your child watch Tyler Perry movies? If the answer is yes, you're a hypocrite. Because if you watch Tyler Perry, even though Tyler Perry isn't dressed in drag, it's a man portraying himself as a woman in drag queen etiquette, if you will. And we know what happened. That man is that man is damn near a billionaire. He gets Marvel Studios to pay him to use his movie sets. And you know what he based that all off all off of? Him operating for the longest time in a dress in multiple shows, in multiple movies, and nobody batted an eye. But yet someone who has their own performance review, home performances, will cater to anybody. Like drag, like the like the uh, drag performer said. When there's children in the like, when there's children in the audience, they adapt. I mean, the same thing. Like, like a long time ago, like I, I keep on bringing up Drag Queen Story Hour because that was the problem that a lot of key parents had. How dare this drag queen turn around and and read to my child? No, you should be happy that someone is trying to help your child read. Honestly, um, at the same time, I, I I use this example. What if someone who was in goth? Dressed up in goth material. I'm talking full on black, paint nails, um, tattoos everywhere, piercings everywhere. Wanted to make sure that your child had an interest in reading. Would you still have a problem with it? I guarantee some people say yes. Well, why did they have to expose my child to that? Because you look at the person that's trying to help versus how they're trying to help your child. And again, with drag queens, they're not doing anything. I'm like, it's always over sexualization, which amazes me so. That why is it over sexualization? Oh, well they're, well, they're trying to expose my child to something. No, they're not. If anything, they're trying to help or entertain or make them laugh. But they're certainly not trying to turn them. That's the big difference. But as Tennessee, unfortunately, Middle Tennessee specifically, passed their law to make um those types of uh performances make sure they're without kids again if i was being petty and that bill that just got passed which may get signed to law by governor lee if i was petty i would go to every twin peaks every hooters every high school that has cheerleaders or has women dressing provocatively and you know what i would say they're vi they're committing felonies but but that's not the same yes it is Adult performances, as described by the law, means that if women are present and you have a woman that's dressed up in Hooters, and we've all been to Hooters, we've all been to Twin Peaks, it fits the law. And if you said, and if again, you have a problem with that, you're a hypocrite. But just want to point that out. Moving right along, guys, I wanted to cover this story because, again, when it comes to LGBTQ plus community, right, it amazes me the level of ignorance people have when someone of that caliber who's already who's all who also is an established educated person they just can't seem to get past certain questions much like this lawmaker decided to ask this uh doctor who this uh pharma this uh pharmacist 
who has her doctorate in pharmacy, decided to ask her a question that was, well, beyond inappropriate. You said that you're a trans woman. I trans female, yes, ma'am, sir. Do you have a penis? Are you telling us that you're unfamiliar with the large body of medical evidence of the harm that has come upon people that have gone through these processes? I'm familiar with a large body of evidence that shows that providing good affirming care saves lives. Are you saying that you're unaware of the large body of medical evidence of the harm that has come upon these people in these processes we've been gone through? I will, Are you unaware of that body of evidence? I will repeat what I just said. Are you unaware of that body of evidence? I will repeat what I just said. You said that you're a trans woman. I trans female, yes, ma'am, sir. Do you have a penis? That's horrible. Yeah. You're the one. You're the one that brought that into the discussion. I you're the one never that said anything about genitalia. Oh, it Is has there? everything to do okay. with genitalia. I don't know audience, what my rights are audience, right now. Audience, if you want to stay in here. I don't know what my rights but, are, but that question was highly inappropriate. To, you do not have to answer any question. If you if you're through, we'll dismiss you. Well, I'm not through with questions, but I'm not going to answer that question. That's okay. highly inappropriate. Again, that I, you can say that, and, and that you're you're right. So. Okay, are I'm a healthcare other, professional, a doctor. Please treat me as such. Next there, question, please. Are there any other questions? Crazy, isn't it? Crazy that yes, that uh, if you want to know, that <laughs> was Republican state senator. Matt McKee, who decided to ask a transgender healthcare professional, are you equipped with that apparatus? And the reason behind that is because this is going behind gender care for trans for, for trans people. Keep in mind that a lot of states, mostly uh, Southern, mostly conservative states, have basically put into laws that gender care, uh, that uh, gender affirming care for transgender people is actually outlawed. And that in Arkansas, of all places, because, you know, you would think in Arkansas, the cousin law is a little bit more looser than anything else. But I digress. Are going and it's like you have these lawmakers who are trying to and keep in mind, this is another thing about lawmakers. Before I go into this rant, I don't get lawmakers who are on who are on certain debates that lack education, that lack education in certain area. For example, um, I truly believe that if you're not transgender, then you cannot talk about care for transgender people. I don't think I, you, you don't have a leg to stand on unless your overall answer is that, yes, they're, the care for transgender is just the same care as any other uh, any other human being, regardless of their preferences. Aside from that, you don't have a leg to stand on in the fight. But you have these, unfortunately, conservative state lawmakers and senators who are asking questions that have nothing to do um, that have nothing to do with the debate of of trying to get these individuals the care and support that they need. They just and they, this kind of goes back to what I was saying that where a lot of these people out here they over sexualize and it just makes you think. It makes you think exactly what is going through their heads when you hear someone say, "Okay, I'm different. For, I am different from you." But you tend to, but you have some people out there that just tend to, to tend to over-sexualize it. Um, case in point, you just heard that, you just heard that one where it's like, okay, do you consider yourself transgender? Yes. Do you have an apparatus? What does that got to do with anything? Oh, it has, it has to, and it's just the, 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 the brazen, the unmitigated gall that he had. Oh, it has everything to do with it. Have you not have you not seen the amount of evidence of that gender affirming care has harmed individuals? And that's conservatives like to stand on. It's a talking point. There is no evidence out there. Just like there's no evidence out there of transgenders, um, of people using transgender uh, labels to go into places where they can cause harm. There's no evidence of that. It's a talking point. It's a talking point to take away from the fact that there is people out there that will use the law to force people to live the way they want them to live instead of ensuring that everybody can live the way they want to. That's the whole point. And again, 
I feel bad because you know what's amazing that out of out of all the responses out of that out of that entire room, out of the entire inside of that room, debate room, all you heard was a separate says, "Look, if you could not contain your outburst, uh, we're gonna ask you to leave." Wait, wait. So you're not gonna get on the state senator who decided to ask a disrespectful, repulsive question, but you're gonna go after the galley because the galley was like, "Is this? Is he serious right now?" Because I can because that's how they that's how they are. It's not the fact of I if, if I was in that if I was in that room, and I'm a lawmaker, I was there to say, "What the frack does that got to do with anything?" What's like you did? It's, like, it's almost like a it's it's like a deep perversion. It is like a deep perversion on their side. Like they have to know. Well, if you're transgender, or you know, are you are you equipped down there? It it's disgusting. It's horrifying. And he's elected. And he's not the only one. There are a lot more out there of him. And that is effing scary. Especially if you're transgender. Which I keep on saying, guys, get involved. Get involved, not at the federal level, but also the local and state levels as well. Because if you don't, more of them will be in more of them will be in a position to make some of you guys' lives very freaking difficult that's all i'm saying but moving right along i wanted to cover the story as well remember governor rick scott you know the same guy that <laughs> that uh dark brandon uh otherwise known as president our president joe biden pointed him out saying that you know he's only he's revising the plans to sunset medicare and social security well even though republicans denied it and dark brandon was like i have the i have the i have your actual plan feel free to come reach out to me well, with all that being said, Governor Rick Scott has, uh, Gov I'm sorry, uh, GOP Senator Rick Scott has came out and said, yeah, we're going to change the plans to where we're going to exempt Medicare and Social Security from sunset. Because as I said before, guys, Republicans, Republicans, Republicans love this. They love to destroy something to the point to where it no longer works. Republicans want to cut funding and keep cutting the budgets and keep cutting things out because you know why there's money in privatization. They tried to go after the po they tried to go after the postal service when the post service was bleeding money, but they kept pulling funding from it and they tried to privatize it until eventually they had to get funding for the post office because the post office is a vital part of the US right next to FedEx and UPS and everything else that delivers mail. Um, even Amazon uses the United States Postal Service. So again, it is a vital, long-time service that was needed. Republicans try to choke it until they try to privatize it. You know what they're coming for next? Education. Education. Uh, schools, uh, especially in especially in Republican-controlled states, they are going to choke education to the point to where number one, grades are terrible. Graduation rates are dropping. You have more dropouts than graduates. They're trying to get to the point to where schools are so bad that they can privatize them and. Bonus and bonus, if you do have religious or charter schools in your area, guess what? Republicans will try to get them public funding. Keep in mind, charter schools and religious schools cannot get public funding because they are not considered part of the public school system. Republicans have been trying to change that for years. And how can they change that? School choice. Oh, you can send your kids anywhere you want to. By introducing school choice, you introduce public funding to charter and religious schools. The same schools who, by the way, get tuition from their parents. And as a person who pays tuition, trust me, them schools are well off. But getting public funding, which means it takes away from other from other from other public schools who desperately need that money much more than those charter and religious schools do, means the end of public education. It becomes privatized. But why do I say that? Because Medicare and Social Security right now are cash booms. Republicans are foaming at the mouth to try to to actually try to sunset those, privatize them because there's money in both programs. Here's the problem. The problem is a lot of people depend on Social Security and Medicare for their prescriptions, for disability payments, things of that nature. They're also voters. Keep in mind, we just finished the midterms. The presidential uh, the presidential uh, uh, race is just next year. And candidates are already starting to come out the woodwork. 
Biden is gearing up for his next re-election run. Trump, if he's still out of prison, <laughs> if he's not in prison yet, will be doing his will be doing his campaign run. And you have people coming out the woodwork on the Republican side because right now it's Trump versus GOP. The GOP is no longer backing Trump. They are trying to separate themselves as far from him as humanly possible. Now, that being said, Rick Scott has changed his plan because if the GOP decides, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't actually try to go after our voters because, again, if you go after Social Security, if you go after Medicare, if you go after all these things that where the majority of the voters are, guess who they're going to vote for? Not you. So again, I can see why Rick Scott all of a sudden, oh, well, we're, we're going to exclude that from the sunset plan. Why? Because I said before, when it comes to the GOP, it is all about privatization. Privatization equals profit. Simple as that. But speaking of things that just don't make any sense, and I say this because I find myself sticking to Tennessee for the better part of this uh, weekend edition. We did actually, again before, we did have our state and midterm elections. And even this one, I swear to you, if Tennessee is not racist, if Tennessee is not racist after this, nothing will convince you. A young man who became one of the uh, youngest uh, Tennessee state representatives, right? This is him right here. That man right there, Representative Justin Pearson, right? Uh, by far one of the youngest state representatives for Tennessee, as you can see, getting sworn in there. And you'll notice he's not wearing the traditional suit and tie. He is actually wearing a daishiki, which again, nothing wrong with that. Daishikis are very comfortable. They represent, they represent African culture and heritage, and I think they're pretty cool. Now, as you can see right there, he, uh, as he's swearing in, it's a great day because I always love to see somebody else than unseasoned Mayo becoming elected officials in Tennessee. That being said, however, he was criticized for his attire, saying, um, especially by another representative, David Hawk, who sat there and said, well, traditional lawmakers uh, wear suit and ties on the House floor. What he meant to say was, black people should follow suit. As he sat there, as, as, as Representative Pearson has said, quote unquote, there's nothing in the rules about attire at all, which he's exactly right. There is no rules for attire uh, when it does come to state representative house. You can come in there playing clothes and they can't say anything to you or try to scold you because, again, not part of the rules. Um, but he did point in there and say a white supremacist has attacked my wearing of my dashiki, that the status quo ought to make some people feel uncomfortable. And again, it's amazing where that same, as I mean, that same breath, the Tennessee House GOP tweeted that um, if Pearson doesn't like the decorum rules that were approved in a bipartisan manner, he should explore a different career opportunity. And they said this is far from a racist attack. <laughs> um, yeah, he's made some people uncomfortable. And I dig it. Because, again, it's a daishiki. It, it's no different then it's no different than uh, a chic wearing the head rare, uh, headwear, uh, head wrap. I forgot what it's called. I apologize. Um, no different than a Muslim bear, uh, wearing their garb. Again, nothing wrong with that because it's clothing. They want to represent themselves. The unseasoned Mayo could learn a lesson from that. That's all I'm saying. But wanted to give that man a shout out. Welcome to the Tennessee floor. Good luck, because there's a lot of idiots in the state in the state representative house. Move right along, though, guys. Um, before we get to our next story, um, things that you should know about, you should be concerned. Um, for a lot of people, but that may or may not remember the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, keep in mind, it was put in there after the after the meltdown of 2008, where we had predatory lending on mortgages, student loans, credit cards, um, things of that nature. Banks running amok. But um, under President Obama's administration, the Consumer, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was put in place to basically be a uh, advocate for you when dealing with things of credit. Same reason why you were able to get your credit report, because they forced the big three, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, to be able to give you your credit report on a yearly basis for free. And you are able to dispute that, even though disputes are a pain in the ass. But still, you can still do it. That being said, however... 
over the years, on uh, over the years, especially in the Trump administration, they have tried to gut the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which now is in the hands of the Supreme Court to be looked into. Now, keep in mind, it is a case that's being listened to by the Supreme Court. They haven't officially taken it over yet, but. If that is the case, they could hear that. They could actually take that case and hear opening arguments. Now, keep in mind, if the CF, if the CFB is, uh, I'm sorry, if the C, <laughs> it's a lot of acronyms. If the CFPB uh, is actually stripped, that means that it's going to be harder for you to do disputes, harder for you to go up against credit agencies, harder for you to do a lot of things just because that is put in place for consumer protections. And again, uh, there are people out there, conservatives, that actually want to see it gone because of their counterparts that give them money. And because their counterparts give them money, they don't like the CFP. Like most credit cards, most credit card companies hate Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Stock market hates the Consumer Financial, hates the CFPB. Um, student loans, especially because again, student loans still haven't changed, that you can still, the, the, the stuff that you sign at 18 years old um, just to go to college. And, you know, you're 18. What do you know? Not all 18, not all 18 years know about finance. So that's predatory lending off the bat. And they're trying to stop it. But again, it is, but again, if the Supreme Court does take it and does rule against CFB, uh, CFPB, it could be Roe versus Wade, except financially for all Americans. And that could hurt us, especially in times of inflation. But we'll keep up with that story as it comes along. This next story, unfortunately, um, is going to be a little rough, a little graphic, because we have had another police shooting uh, of an unarmed Louis, of an unarmed black man in Louisiana. And as I, before I get started, guys, the video in itself um, is graphic, so viewer discretion is advised. Investigating, they took several days before releasing this video, but you have a community asking so many questions about the video you're about to see, and I have to warn everyone. It is tough to watch and even tough to listen to because you can hear the officer crying after the shot is fired. The entire incident took less than two minutes. Two officers arrive at the home of Alonzo Bagley just before 11 p.m. In response to a 911 call, his wife made complaints. He was threatening her and her daughter. Hey, what's your name? Alonzo. Hey, can you step out for me? Okay. No. What you need? My dog. Out? I got dog. No, no, come on in, sir. He just grabbed right. the piece. The people next door over there. Let me put my dog over there. Sit down. Let me, let me put my dog Sit down. Right. Let, the, let her. Hey, come here. Come here. Put my dog up. She can put the dog up. The first officer follows Bagley down the hallway after he says he's going to put his dogs away as his wife continues to yell in the background. Hey, hey. The officer realizes Bagley is heading out the door of a balcony and sees him jump from the second floor to the ground below. He then turns back to run through and out of the apartment downstairs to chase after Bagley. Once outside, you hear one officer yell to the other. He went that way, cop. About five seconds later, you hear a single gunshot. It's been one minute and 25 seconds since officers first knocked on the door. No, this right, send EMS right now. Shut fire, shut fire. For the next two minutes, you hear the officers distraught and pleading with Bagley to keep breathing and see the two officers administer CPR. No, no, no. Tyler, you good. Hey, no, hey, no, no. hey, come on, 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 no, no, come on, no, no, come on, no, man, no, no, you're good, you're good, no, man. come on, dude, this come on, man, see an EMS right now, 1018, 1018, come on, dude, hey. come on, dude, stay with me, stay with me, hey, stay with me, no pressure. Stay with me, man. Come on. Stay with me. Come on, you're good. You're good, bro. Stay you're with me. Hey, you're good. Hey, keep breathing. Keep breathing. Stay keep breathing. With me. Keep breathing. Stay with me, man. Stay with me. Breathing. Hey, you're good, man. Keep breathing. Keep breathing, dude. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. Fuck. Dude. Riley, hey, go to go to the front of the building. Go to the front of the building. Wave them down. Wave them down with your flashlight. Come on. 
Run, 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 run. Hey, hey, dude, you, hey, you're gonna be all right. You're gonna be all right. Look at me. Hey, look at me. 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 Hey, wake up. Wake up. Look at me. Look at me. Hey, respond. Come on. Come on. Come on. Wake up. Respond. But he doesn't wake up. Bagley's later pronounced dead at a local hospital. Alexander Tyler, the officer who fired that shot, was arrested today on a charge of negligent homicide. His lawyer says he hopes the body cam footage is thoroughly reviewed for the facts and evidence. Officers are always faced on a day-to-day -day basis with dangerous situations like that and at times where they have to make split-second decisions where they're in a potential life threatening situation. The mere fact that uh, an argument is being made by the investigator in court that he was unarmed does not necessarily mean he's not a threat to the officer. Bagley's brother, who also viewed the video today, said it wasn't an easy thing to watch. It took me back to being a little brother watching my older brother take his last breath. And so let's just call it what it is. Um, I have to ask that question. Why did he fire? I mean, yes, there was a there was a call that was put in um, about disturbing the peace. Yes, he did go out the back door and jump the balcony and run. Yes, he did all of those things. But the question remains, what did he do for the officer to fire a kill shot? He was unarmed. So again, that's the reason why that officer is being charged with negligent homicide, because he has to explain why he fired. But I can only imagine the words he feared for his life are going to come along the line somewhere. But this is the thing when it comes to police. This is the reason why black, why people of color, us, are always going to sit there and be leery of law enforcement, because they really, for the longest part, kind of got a green light to shoot us. Because this is the reason why I said say about body cam, and I have a theory about body cam footage. Number one, if it's released almost immediately, officers found no fault of their own. If anything, it validates them. When the body cam footage is delayed, might be a problem on the officer side. They don't want the public to know because it's like George Floyd all over again because they're, they're afraid that public opinion will be swayed already and that that cop may not have a chance of defending himself. Which, again, in this case, this officer is going to have a hard time defending himself because we all have to ask that question. Why did you shoot? Why did you shoot an armed black man? How, how, much of a threat he, how much of a threat was he truly to you if he did not have a weapon on him? That is the, the $35,000 question. That's all I'm saying. But we will follow that story as it goes along because, again, it just it's a long list it's a long list that unfortunately just keeps getting longer of officers killing black men and women and accountability just doesn't seem to add up anywhere. That's why police reform is needed. Um, but speaking of things that just might involve police, um, we did talk about this story also during the week of uh, residents in Ohio, especially East Palestine, especially with the derailment of trains that involved hazardous chemicals that had to be burned in order to uh, in order to take care of the mess. However, uh, that you had uh, damaged soil, um, pets, animal, livestock were all affected by it. And so they decided they were to go have a town hall. Guess who didn't show up? Frustration, anger, and unanswered questions in East Palestine, Ohio. Are my kids safe? Are the people safe? Is the future of this community safe? The mayor leading the meeting, at times speaking through a bullhorn to answer questions from distressed residents, still worried about returning to their homes, despite evacuation orders being lifted last week. The railroad did us wrong. So far, they've worked with us and they're fixing it. But if that stops, I will guarantee you, I will be the first one in line to fight that. Officials trying to answer the community's questions. That evacuation zone has been determined by the Department of Transportation and other subject matter experts based on 
previous instance. Is everybody satisfied with my answer? As many residents are demanding more testing of air, water, and soil. We're not going to let them stop the testing until you're satisfied. That's where the testing is not. Not present at this community meeting, Norfolk Southern Railroad. No, Norfolk Southern didn't show up. They didn't feel it was safe. In the 11th hour, the company that owns the train that derailed sent a statement saying, unfortunately, after consulting with community leaders, we have become increasingly concerned about the growing physical threat to our employees. Okay, well, if you're afraid that somebody from Palestine is going to hurt your employees, what exactly did you do to us? You feel the anger and frustration. I'm scared. For my family. I'm scared from my town. I grew up here. I'm related to 50% of them. Cleanup efforts are underway. The governor telling residents Wednesday the municipal water is safe to drink. His statement comes after new test results from the state environmental protection agency found no detection of contaminants. Officials say the toxic spill was largely contained the day after the derailment and that tests have shown the air quality is safe. They are still suggesting those with private wells get their water tested. I need help and I'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. So, yeah, you can understand exactly where they're coming from with that, um, because it's easy to sit there and say that everything is safe when you're literally nowhere near the crowd, nowhere near the side of the accident. And of course, the uh, the train company that's involved nowhere to be found. Why is it nowhere to be found? Well, aside from explaining what's in the next clip, what's going on with the with the pets and things of that nature over there, um, they decided to give a little bit of a notice. And again, it's weak sauce. At the County Humane Center, Teresa McGuire says she hears about sick pets and livestock every day. We're hearing a lot of this. We're hearing a lot of decreased appetite, not wanting to drink. If they do drink, they're throwing up. Luke Lavin says he's too afraid to return to his home half a mile from the crash site. I don't want to go home because I don't I don't have the answers to go home. Anger mounting in East Palestine. Nearly two weeks after a fiery train derailment and controlled burn of hazardous chemicals sent a huge, dark, toxic cloud over this rural community. And despite almost daily assurances that days later it was safe for thousands of evacuees to return home. What do you say to people who are just scared? You know, I, I say, uh, first and foremost, I'm a father, uh, a husband. All families want to be safe, and they need to know that their air is clean and their water is safe to drink. Today, the country's top environmental official here personally trying to reassure residents. Was it the correct call to tell people that they could go back and end the evacuation? Uh, you know, the, the, the state uh, made that declaration in concert with both governors in Pennsylvania and Ohio. The state made the right call based on the data that we have. Officials promising to expand environmental testing to areas further from the crash site, and urging residents to seek medical attention if they are feeling ill. Norfolk Southern, the train operator, telling the community we will not walk away, posting an open letter after saying it feared for its employees' safety if they attended a recent town hall meeting. The company is facing demands for more accountability. They need to be here in the community and they need to be answering questions. Another of Norfolk Southern's trains derailed this morning in Michigan. No hazardous materials aboard, no injuries, the company said. Meanwhile, in Ohio, residents keep a stockpile of bottled water and worry. And you're saying it's okay, but don't drink the water, use bottled water. That doesn't make sense. You know, Ron, lots of assurances, but residents there just don't seem to trust what they're being told. Exactly. And officials here say they're being transparent and posting as much information as they can online, like test results. But at the same time, we talk to residents who say they want more independent experts here, not just government officials and politicians. And can you blame them? Because it's like the matter is when you sit there, I'm going to go first and foremost, when you are sitting there, and you're saying that, hey, we cannot attend your town meeting because our employees' safety concerns, our employees' safety concerns about what? There's not going to be, look, there's not going to be violent people at these town halls. They are going to want answers. 
And you would think from the simple fact of the matter, it's like, okay, well, if they want answers, we should be able to give them answers. But things have a greater impact when you're in person versus you giving press conferences from your nice little security laden place. I mean, even representatives that you see coming forward was like, they had state troopers right next, they had state troopers and law enforcement officers right next to them. People don't, people, civilians, when their homes are damaged or there's threat or, or threat of life or loss of life there, what do you, they're not going to, they're not going to lash out. I mean, they want answers. I mean, Flint, Michigan was, Flint, Michigan was water was being poisoned for years, decades. I didn't see anybody from that group when ready to take out most of Michigan's uh, legislature. I didn't see pitchforks. I didn't see white khakis. I didn't see torches. They wanted answers. And answers work best when, per, when the people responsible are there. But yes, independent studies should be given because the same corporation that was too cheap to put the right type of brakes on these trains as it once was regulated. And there, and these are the same people that are telling you that your water is safe, your air is safe. No, I want independent studies done, not from you. Because right now, this is this is you doing dam uh, damage crisis mode and trying to put a spin on everything. So no, I don't blame those residents for wanting to get answers. I blame the corporations who actually lack the who actually lack the cojones to actually show up and say, yes, this was our fault. Yes, we're trying to do everything we can. Yes, we're going to pay back damages. That's what it should, that's what they really should have said. We're going to pay back damages for things that happen to your home, for you know, loss of work, things of that nature. If you have health ailments, we'll take care of that. Oh, and don't expect the, you know, the government to put their feet to the fire because again, the government sent their EPA team to support the local government there. But that's going to be the extent of what they can do because unfortunately, East Palestine, Ohio is not Ukraine. Just saying. But move right along, guys. Um, we did want to cover the story because I've always talked about Fox News. I have always said that Fox News is not a real news station. Fox News is a conservative pillow wet dream for a lot of people that just want to hear their talking points inside of the smallest echo chamber in all of media. Unfortunately, there may be some comeuppance thanks to a wonderful lawsuit held by Dominion Voting Systems since the beginning of Trump's tenure. And it looks like now those chickens may be coming home to roost. Some of the biggest stars and top executives at Fox News were privately making fun of former President Trump's claims about election fraud. Even as the network was allowing those lies to be promoted on air, that is according to damning messages, damning messages in a new court filing that was out yesterday. The messages are included in Dominion's $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox News. They show that Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, Larry Ingram brutally mocked the 2020 election lies that Trump and his allies were pushing at the time. In one exchange, Carlson texted Ingram saying that Sidney Powell, that attorney who was in and out of the Trump White House, was, quote, lying and that he had, quote, caught her doing so. Ingram responded, Sidney is a complete nut. No one will work with her. Ditto with Rudy. He continued, quote, our viewers are good people and they believe it. Joining us now with his reporting on this lawsuit is CNN senior media reporter Oliver Darcy. It's remarkable to see these text messages, but also to have seen what was being said publicly. You know, I was covering the White House at that mm -hmm. time to see how White House officials were watching to see what Fox was saying about uh, the election. I think these messages really just expose Fox News as a propaganda network. That's what they do at the core. I mean, they show in excruciating detail that the highest ranking executives at Fox News, uh, Rupert Murdoch, Suzanne Scott, the CEO, as well as some of the top hosts, like you just mentioned, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, they knew, they privately knew these election claim frauds, uh, fraud claims from the, the Trump team were nonsense. They used very harsh language to describe them, but they allowed these lies to take hold on the network's air. And they show, these messages show that the, um, the, the talent over at Fox News and the executives were very worried after the election of the audience rebelling, that they were going to Newsmax. You'll remember that Donald Trump was attacking Fox News, saying, turn the channel, go to this, this Newsmax channel, which is saturating the airwaves with election denialism. They were worried about this. And not only did they turn a blind eye to the election lies, but they even, in some cases, tried cracking down on those who were fact-checking Trump. Um, there's one case where White House correspondent Jackie Heinrich, she fact-checked Trump and Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity behind the scenes were talking about getting her fired. That's that's how 
um, lacking of basic journalistic ethics uh, were at place at Fox News. And these messages really expose it. Yeah. And, and we've seen what Fox said about this audio. You know, they said there'll be a lot of noise and confusion generated by Dominion and their opportunistic private equity owners. But the core of this case remains about the freedom of the press and freedom of speech. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, briefly, can you remind us why Dominion cares yes. about this? Because that's why this lawsuit matters. Well, a lot of the election conspiracy theories were focused on Dominion, basically uh, focused on these voting uh, technology companies, suggesting that they may have allowed the election to be rigged. And so they are arguing that it was because Fox News advanced these theories because it was in their business interests. And that's why we're seeing these messages come out today. I just realized I was muted the entire time. I apologize. So let me recap. Fox may go down because why? Because Dominion um, has all the receipts. And now you have text messages from the, from the three-headed Hydra. That means that at the end of it all, Fox News may take a hit. But unfortunately, they are still considered to some a news station. There's just no if, ands, or buts around that. As much that's messed up. But speaking of messed up, Ron DeSantis wanting to whitewash black history. That story just doesn't end. Calling for diversity and inclusion amid an ongoing feud over a new AP African American Studies course. Governor DeSantis suggested the state could sever ties with the College Board, which offers advanced placement courses and the SAT, after the board accused state officials of slander and misinformation about a new AP African American Studies course. The controversy comes as Missouri's Rockwood School District is dealing with a number of resignations amid a campaign to get rid of their school's diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Three of those programs have already been cut. ABC Start Here Daily Podcast is taking a deeper look at this issue, and host Brad Milkey is here with more on this. Uh, Brad, thanks for coming on. I know uh, Rockwood is um, a predominantly white district, but many black students are, are bussed in as part of a desegregation program. So walk us through where does this controversy start? What are the arguments here? Right, well, you know, we've been talking so much about critical race theory, which civil rights advocates say is kind of a red herring, like critical race theory is not taught in K through 12. But what these advocates say is what this has provided is a chance to get rid of programs that actually do exist mm -hmm. in areas like St. Louis. So St. Louis is a great example because, like you said, historically very segregated school districts, very white districts, very black districts. Black parents actually have the option of sending their black kids to these predominantly white districts, uh, which are traditionally better funded. And so as a result, you've got programs at some of these schools that are meant to make some of the minority population feel more empowered, like a program that takes 50 middle school diverse, you know, a diverse group of 50 middle school girls and teaches them about self-empowerment and entrepreneurship. 
what has been happening is parents have been complaining that these programs actually are sort of segregating the school, and they've systematically been asking the school board to roll these programs back. Now, you spoke to students of color in Rockwood that were or, or still are involved in some of these programs. Uh, what are they saying? All right, we talked to a couple seniors, uh, Kylie and Sam. And, you know, just to give you an example, Sam is originally from Kenya, came to the U.S. as a kid. And he says, you know, think about this through my eyes. I grew up in this predominantly black country. Now I'm in this predominantly white school district. It's not that many people that look like me. And yet there were teachers and administrators along the way saying, hey, we have this program that will hopefully make you feel a little bit more included, a little bit less alone. He said that was a complete game changer. Kylie says that she actually wants to go to college, come back and really help the, the racial segregation problem in her town. They say these programs are essential for that. And yet you've seen more and more at these school board meetings, parents saying, what are these programs actually getting our students? They're actually making the white kids uncomfortable, so we should start to roll these programs back. So what what is the center of that argument? What's the basis of that argument? Uh, and where does this go from here? Right, I mean, there's two main things that, that parents have been saying, predominantly white parents at these school board meetings. Uh, one is transparency, which is that, can we be sure that some of the administrators that have been pushing this don't stand to actually benefit financially from these contracts? Because okay. there were questions about some relationships there, Yeah, right? that's right. Like, if a school administrator is saying, hey, I, you know, we should bring in this non-for-profit program when that person sits on the board of that non-for-profit program. So that's one of the issues. But more and more, you saw parents continually saying, these programs don't benefit all the students. By that, they mean the white students. One of the parents specifically said, they don't benefit all the tax-paying families in the school district. What do they mean by that? Well, remember, a lot of these black students are bust in. So when they're talking about tax-paying families in the district, a lot of black families hear that and they think, oh, I see, it's enough that our kid is in the district. These parents don't wanna pay extra to make our kid feel more comfortable. So what's the way forward here? Because th there have been several administrators, at least three, I think, who've resigned, five a uh, longer term, but yeah. since kind of this, this more acute argument has been happening. Um, They've cut at least three programs so far. So right. what happens from here? Have they found a middle ground or is this going to continue? Well, no, I think this continues. In fact, just in the last year, three different administrators, it, it hasn't just been enough that the programs have been cut. You've actually had parents going specifically after the administrators by name, flooding their inboxes saying, this is on you for even bringing this program here to begin with. And at this point, three different administrators in Rockwood School District have resigned citing public pressure. We tried to talk to several of them. None of them felt comfortable going on the record with us. That's how fraught this has become come right now, that people are actually laying low because of how intense these conversations are becoming. All right. Well, we appreciate you getting involved in there. I know. That's crazy, isn't it? That when it all comes down to it, you know, when you're just trying to ensure that history is being taught and that not just whitewash history to make white people feel great, but the fact that you also want to make sure that black history is being taught as well. And it's amazing that when you teach black history, you are teaching real history. And as I said before, America has to talk about its dark spots. You do have to talk about slavery. You do have to talk about the internment camps that you had at one point. You do have to talk about the fact that you try to commit that you try to commit genocide on Native Americans. Um, previous answer, uh, previous uh, non um, raisin potato salad uh, warriors try to do. You have to talk about the dark spots. You have to talk about the town. You have to talk about the black towns that were rioted, massacred, drowned. You have to talk about that. Why? Because that's America's history. America's history is not all sunshine and rainbows and we did everything right. No. It is plunder, it is murder, it is genocide, it is all those things and then some. Um, because again, that is history that we need to know. And if it makes a few if it makes a few unseasoned male people uncomfortable, it should, because that's your ancestors. I can only imagine that every time you have read about the destruction of, of Middle Eastern races and what they've done in the past, you don't blink an eye. Why? It doesn't affect you. But when you find out that it's your own folks that did it, now all of a sudden you're in your feelings. Miss me with that BS. Again, with Dictator DeSantis in Florida, it's almost like he can do whatever he wants. And the fact that a lot of people think the way he thinks is effing scary, considering he's considering a, a presidential bid in 2024. And like someone said before me, um, if you thought Trump was bad, wait till the next one. The next one is going to be worse because he's not going to get caught. And that should, if that doesn't wake you up and get you informed, I don't know what does or what will.
But speaking of things that are getting informed, um, also presidential hopeful Nikki Haley, if that is her real name, which we know it's not, has decided that not only is she running for office, that she wants to uh, input a complacency test for older politicians. Yeah, you just can't make this up. His annual physical exam today, the president has faced questions about whether his age could preclude him from running for re-election. Yesterday, Republican former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley kicked off her campaign for the GOP nomination, proposing a mental competency test for politicians over 75. White House correspondent Karen Travers joins me live now for more on this. Uh, Karen, thanks for coming on. I know you talk to radio hosts across America every day. So what are they focused on when it comes to President Biden's health? Yeah, Diane, tying that physical today that the president is getting to that potential re-election campaign for the 80-year-old president. The president said in a recent interview that he is a big believer in fate and that if there were some health reasons that would prevent him from doing his job fully, he would be honest with the American people. Today, we'll get details from his doctor about his health and how he's doing. When he had his physical in November 2021, his doctor said he was healthy, he was vigorous, and he was fit for duty, but did notice two things compared to previous exams, a stiffened gait, a little difference in his walk, and more frequent throat clearing. Diane, two big differences from that physical a year and a half ago. He's had COVID since then. He had that rebound case of COVID after taking Paxlovid, and we all remember when the president fell off his bike in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, but of course he didn't require medical attention. So the White House is expecting he'll get another clean bill of health. We should get that from his doctor later today. And what's the reaction to Nikki Haley's campaign and her proposal of a mental competency test for older politicians? You know, the White House does not want to talk about politics. And the uh, press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, defers all questions about any potential campaign. But they'll say this is the president who shows how competent he is out there when he does events, that he does multiple events a day, that he is healthy, he is vigorous, and that he demonstrates his ability to do the job by doing the job. Meanwhile, we're also now learning that the FBI recently searched two locations at the University of Delaware. Okay. So it's amazing that Nikki Haley decided that of all times, yes, president, uh, uh, politicians over 75 should take a complacency test. I got one better. How about every politician take a complacency test? Because why not just limit it to older citizens? I've said it before um, on this show that I do think those that serve as a representative and those that serve as a senator should be placed in the same terms as the presidential office. You get to serve two consecutive terms and then you have to sit one congressional session out. I guarantee if we implemented that at the House and at the Senate, not just the federal level, but at the local level, watch how fast things change. But at the same time, let's introduce a complacency test, because if you haven't noticed, you don't need anything to be a politician. You just have to be on the ballot, get yourself on the ballot, which means getting enough signatures on and giving enough signatures um, in your home, in your district to get on the ballot, get voted in. And that's it. Win your election, win your election, win, you're in. No degree required, no degree or experience required. And that is saying a lot, especially if you're a judge. A judge, same way. To be a judge in your home state, for a lot of for a lot of states, no formal lawyer, not uh, no formal knowledge of the law or being a lawyer or prosecutor, no longer required. Not required at all. People off the street can be a judge, and that can go sideways very quickly. But again. Complacency tests should be put in place, not just for politicians over 75, but for anybody that wants to join. Why? Because I want to know exactly the type of people that are trying to run for office so bad, because I wonder if we had that complacency test in place with a certain past degree, uh, for a certain past fail, would Marjorie Taylor Greene really be in the House of Representatives right now? Would Jim Jordan uh, as a senator? Would... um. Would uh, Tim Scott be a senator? I'm, I'm not just saying I'm not just saying Republicans, but let's be honest, a lot of them wouldn't cross the bar. But also, Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, would they be? Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, would they be? Now keep in mind, notice I didn't say AOC. Notice I didn't say uh, any of the squad because, well, they're educated. I didn't mention Bernie Sanders because even at his age, he still knows a lot more about what's going on than most of the younger politicians. But 
What a nice thing. It's a nice thing, Nikki Haley, but uh, good luck trying to be presidentially nominated among a group of people, especially the GOP, that does not like women at all. But go for it. Move right along, guys. I wanted to cover this story as well because imagine you are working the graveyard shift for a lot of people that do work the night in graveyard shifts at most processing plants, except in this processing plant, there are immigrant workers under the age of 13 working at this plant. And somehow it went under the radar until a whistleblower finally, finally said something. And keep in mind what I just said. 13-year-old children working a graveyard shift at a processing plant. And you wonder why we have child labor laws. In Grand Island, Nebraska, dozens of workers file into one of several slaughterhouses across the Midwest. And tonight, officials from the Department of Homeland Security tell NBC News federal investigators are looking into whether 50 children who were illegally employed by Packers Sanitation Services, or PSSI, some as young as 13, were victims of human trafficking. In August, the Department of Labor opened an investigation into PSSI, scouring company records from 50 locations. So far, they say at least 50 children were found to be working graveyard shifts for PSSI and at least five locations, including the Grand Island plant and a second JBS Foods plant in Worthington, Minnesota. Audrey Lutz has been helping migrant children who say they worked at the Grand Island plant. It was the hardest phone call of my career to receive that there were children uh, and young children, you know, 13 and 14, working out at the meatpacking plant and on the cleaning crew. In court filings, the company did not deny hiring children, but attributed it to rogue individuals who presented fake identification. You met them. Did they look like adults to you? I would have a hard time ever calling the people I've met with adults. Uh, they certainly look, especially the, the youngest middle schoolers, um, no way to pass as an adult. PSSI's 17,000 employees clean the largest meat processing plants in America for household brands at 700 sites across the country. Former employees we spoke to said it's a dangerous working environment. But be prepared to undergo extreme temperature changes from hot to cold, withstand wetness and humidity, and work around chemicals. Lute says she thinks the children may have been part of a trafficking scheme that led them to work at a slaughterhouse in her town of just over 50,000 people. There's too many coincidences with these children to think that this wasn't some kind of plot uh, entertained by a trafficker, uh, a coyote, a smuggler, um, or potentially even somebody who worked for PSSI. A spokeswoman for PSSI says investigators from Homeland Security Investigations have not contacted the company and said in a statement, we have always taken rigorous steps to comply with the law, including use of the government's e-verify system for new hires, extensive training for all hires managers, multiple audits, and use of biometrics. So far, no penalties or fines have been imposed, but Lutz is calling for accountability. They are responsible for hiring uh, minors and noticeable minors in facilities across the country, and they need to pay that price, either financially or criminally. All right, Julia Ainsley joins us now from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Julia, you have reporting. I know that DHS is also looking into whether the children were possibly victims of human trafficking. That's right. And DHS investigators have said that they've so far found no indications that the company, PSSI, actually would have been part of a trafficking scheme so far. But they are looking at who may have profited off of this, who might have supplied them with fraudulent documents or have given them housing as part of what could be a human trafficking scheme. So some of the kids you mentioned were as young as 13. How did authorities figure out that, th that there were children possibly working at these plants? Well, it actually goes back to 2016. There was a police report from that time where teachers were reporting a young girl who was in class with burns, and they're also uh, because of the chemicals that they were using to clean. And she it was found it was found to be overnight from her PSSI job. This is back in 2016. At the time, local police investigated her parents, but PSSI was never uh, a defendant in that. Says a lot, doesn't it? And again, this is why I sit there and say the entire time, it is amazing that, you know, we're seeing more cases of human, tra of human trafficking, but at the same time, it is very small where they're looking. I mean, they're looking at places like laundry rooms, pizza places, but meat processing plants um, in areas to where 13-year-olds are passing by as 
somehow get through E-Verify and somehow um, get hired on and work in graveyard shifts. Yeah, I can see why human trafficking would be a thing because it just it just all sounds off. And of course, we expect corporate to stare and say, well, Homeland Security hasn't contacted us. Yeah, that usually means that you're about to be visited by the Attorney General's office uh, for criminal ne- for criminal charges. Because, um, again, with child labor laws in place, and I guess it goes out, it, 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 even though it doesn't need to be said, but we have to say it anyway, 13-year-olds shouldn't be working graveyard shifts, whether illegal or not just because of the laws we have in this country. But we will follow that story as it goes along, just because, again, there's a lot of smoke here. It just depends on what happens next. But we're going to go and move on to our feel-good segment, because usually how the fact we got here, we do cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom. Kind of makes you lose your faith in humanity, but, hey, it's the weekend. Hopefully you're nice and bundled where you are, because Mother Nature is going through some things. So hopefully you're remaining safe. But we do want to leave you guys out with some good vibes, uh, definitely on a smooth note to go out to this weekend. And I think the next story will definitely do that by a famous TikToker who has found out, um, who tries to, you know, do his best to promote food and to bring people um, to businesses that could surely use it. Surprise for a beloved local bakery owner, our Will Reed, is outside her shop in Brooklyn with TikTok sensation Keith Lee. Keith uses his TikTok, which has nearly 10 million followers, to highlight small businesses. And here's a look. I'm in New York. I got a chopped cheese, a bacon, egg, and cheese, and a bunch of snacks I've never tried before. My wife is personally convinced this is the best local spot here in Vegas. Let's try it and rate it one through 10. Yesterday afternoon, I got an email. The email read, I'm an employee at Frankincense Pizzeria. It's really slow. We really can't afford rent, and we would love for you to come and try the food. I got it. Let's try it. Garlic knots off rip. These look amazing. Boy. Mm. Since the Frankincense news, I haven't been able to get to to him through the phone. I see why. I just pulled up. I see why. The door is all the way up here. The line goes all the way back there. This is crazy. How many saw this man on TikTok? Wow. Oh, wow. Amazing. The that is. power of TikTok and the mm-hmm. power of Keith. And Keith and Will, they are ready for our big surprise. Hey, Will. Hey, yes, we are, Michael. Good morning. We are in Brooklyn, New York. We are outside the burgery on bake on the bakery on Bergen. Hot start there, Keith. Yeah. Speaking of hot, it's cold outside. We're going to go inside, get some warm cookies and surprise a deserving business owner. But first, why did this small business stand out to you out of all the ones that you visit? I heard about this from another influencer, and I'm so happy I did because I went and tried it, and it was delicious. All right. Well, I want to get in on the fun, and we're going to go surprise a Kim right now. So come with me. It is time for a television surprise, which is my favorite kind of surprise. And hopefully, uh, Kim, the owner and operator here, feels the same way. We will let our camera go in first at the bakery bakery on Bergen. I got to get that right. Now, is a Kim van here? Is that a Kim? Yes. Hi, my name is Will Reeve. I'm going to need you to come right or Can you come around here? All right, yeah. great. So this is a Kim and this is a wonderful bakery. It smells so good. Hi, it's nice to meet you. You You are live on television right now. Just so you know, you look wonderful. I love your hat. It's fabulous. Um, You are so much more than just delicious desserts. Come on in here, Keith. You're part of this too. You know this guy? So now you understand what's going on. Okay. All right. You're just going to be along for the ride. Yes, hi. You're going to be along for the ride here. But first, we just want to show America um, how special you are and how special, (laughs) how much you and your bakery mean to the people that you serve. Let's take a look. Hi, it's Kim from the Bakery on Bergen with our newest flavor. A Kim Van started her business, the Bakery on Bergen, eight years ago in the heart of Brooklyn, determined to invest back into her neighborhood. My mom really took leadership into her own hands and she created a space that was for community. Designing a sweet escape from the ordinary, a place where she can serve up a hot tray of cookies and a spoonful of knowledge. She's taken her extraordinary math skills and set up this additional kind of framework within the Bakery on Bergen where she works as a student coach. We're all fired up here at the Bakery on Bergen. Akim making giving back her mission, serving as a role model to kids in her community. I think more people need to see women women of color, 
single women, mothers that are doing things that are unique to themselves, inspiring people. Creating an empowering space with one key ingredient, love. My mom is fierce. She's inspiring. She always believed in us. When folks tell me I can't do something, I still go out and do it and accomplish it because that's how I was raised. Do it and accomplish it. All right. So... You guys can be crying. I don't cry. <laughs> we love it. Crying. No, no, we love Bring them out. Bring out the tears. <laughs> How does it feel to see all those people who love you and love your bakery say such great things about oh what you mean Oh, my gosh. It feels so good. Those are some dear, dear to my heart people. Um, you are funny. <laughs> I know this is your I'm son, not, by the way. I was like, what is going on? I was like, what is he doing? And then the guy with the thing, I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> it's all wonderful. Oh and here's gosh. your old pal, Keith. He is oh going to post God. that video. I was video. so nervous. I was like, wait, <laughs> wait. And then I was like, okay, well, maybe he, because he thought I, I you did say I gave good customer service. Okay. I was like, well, maybe he's not going to be mean to me. And so instead <laughs> of like not doing something mean, he's just not going to post it. <laughs> so he is going to post that video later today. And we have more surprises in store. But first, Keith, thank you for being here. Thank you for showcasing this oh place. My and my question for you is what made your experience here so special? Kim D. Uh, yo. Customer service was through the roof. You had no idea who I was. I did not know who you You made your green tea latte for me like four times. <laughs> <laughs> We're big on that. Like, we want people to Customer have it. Customer exactly. service was amazing. And the chocolate chip cookie, crazy. Thank you. That's where I want to come back in because yeah. you talk about the customer service. Yes. It's clearly a wonderful place, but yes. I would like to have a cookie. I hear the, what's it, the salted sea chocolate, the sea salt chocolate chip. She told chip. me it was the best one. Okay. Yes. It was yes. right. Yes. No, I mean, I, right. can we, yes. these look like so, cookies. Yes, those, those ones right there. Okay, I'm just going to dive in. I'm not going to be precious about it. Oh, there's yes, a little paper so on the bottom. Yeah, Which, we you got to right have one there. too, man. Yeah. It'd Ooh. be an honor to do <laughs> like a food review with you. Look how soft they are. Cheers. Oh, yeah, I already went to it. Look how soft that is. No, see, he's the TikTok pro. I know. He knows oh how to God. show it off. Oh, my gosh. Um, so talking with a mouthful on TV is, is not really good form. Yeah. So good, right? Um, I also don't really know what to do with this cookie, but <laughs> we do have a few more spies. So you're on Good Morning America. Oh, it's Good Morning. <laughs> <laughs> we, brought, okay. we brought Keith, who is going to do that video. He's going to post it. Hopefully, that'll bring a whole lot more people in to have these okay, delicious cookies. I go back cookies. to sleep now. <laughs> well, I don't, know if you're be able to, I don't know if you're going to be able to sleep after I tell you this next part. Our friends at Duncan, Duncan Hines are really into creating sweet moments. They heard about you. Shut. They partnered with us, and they decided they'd like to bring you $10,000 for you and your bakery. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Take this big check, please. You can't actually cash this one, but we will get you. Oh we will God. get you what you need. So um, yeah, that's real. Oh my God. This is all for you. You can hold it. I've got to hold my cookie oh my and my confetti. Yes. Guys, oh a delicious, God. sweet success here at the bakery oh on Bergen goodness. in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you to a Kim Van. Thank you to TikTok superstar so Keith Lee. Thank you to all of you. Come visit if you're in the area. Maybe you can start doing, you know, nationwide shipments with your yes. 10 grand. Yes. <laughs> Everything good? Thank you so much. Thank you so oh much. God, you. And her cookies are about as big as that right, chicken. They are. <laughs> They're delicious. Now, I thought that was pretty cool. And now I want cookies. Um, I just like to see when I just like to see great things happen to people, especially black people and my melanated people and my seasoned male. But that's gonna do it for this podcast, guys. I do thank you all for watching, for liking, for letting people know this was live. I certainly appreciate that. Um, some shameless plug before you do that, I get out of here because we do have new graphics and things come along the way, but still want to shout out my buddy Big BZA dot. Um, definitely check him out, Big BZA dot on all socials. He usually, uh, especially his beats page on YouTube where he does have beats that he makes and he does put them for sale. Definitely check that out as well as his TikTok. As for yours truly, guys, Black Fox 447 on all socials. I usually post uh, post and review things that I watch, that I play, that I read, that um, and just do, especially gym stuff, because I do a couple push-ups. Um, at the same time, guys, uh, the other part of this, the link that you see at the bottom, if I could just make that just a wee bit bigger, there we go. Uh, make that, a, basically, if you take that link, copy and paste in your browser, we'll take you to the link tree that's the YouTube and Facebook groups for all of my podcasts. How the fact we got here, get bit, and of course, the Offense Podcast. Definitely like, share, subscribe, let people know what you think about it. Let me know what you think about it, whether you liked it or not. I still want to know. Um, 
beyond that, guys, uh, again, if you are going to be traveling, um, and I do say traveling because a lot of people are still traveling, um, please be aware. Wear a mask if need be or if it's required. If you are sick, please stay at home because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, there's still cases, even though it's not said a lot these days, um, there's still cases of COVID. There's still cases of Corona, H R uh, RSV, HSV still in the air. When you protect yourself, you protect others, and that's how we're going to get through this pandemic. Also, at the same time, guys, I, I, I want to encourage people. By that, by that, I want to simply say like this. There is no competition. You are, you know, you, you are in your own lane with your own goals, with your own progress. You should not be looking at others to see exactly where you measure up because everybody is different. If we were all the same, we would all win and we would all lose at the same time. So keep pushing, keep grinding. I am rooting for you. I am rooting for you. I am your biggest cheerleader. The only thing stopping you is you. As soon as you understand the competition in the mirror, everything else is understood. But I'm rooting for you. The last thing I'll say about how the frame got here, the, how the frame got here, guys, is all about staying informed. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are simply giving you all the information allowing you to make up your own mind, but provide a logical perspective that goes along with it. We do a lot better in society once we're informed. We're progressive. We move forward. We try to right the wrongs of our past by making decisions now that we should have done back then, like electing our first black woman Supreme Court, electing our first black woman Federal Board of Governors, electing our first black four-star military general, all great things. However, when we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. That's why we keep asking ourselves, why does everything go about our paycheck? Why are we electing this uh, same politi different politicians, sometimes the same politicians? <laughs> but why are we electing different politicians but still the same old game in Congress? And most importantly, how the frack we got here. Thank you all for watching, guys. Take care of yourselves and each other. We will all get through this. Peace.